Hi everyone, welcome to the Barrington James podcast, a Technology and Science. I'm Matthew Witchells, your host. Uh, today's joining me is the CEO of UNU, Jeffrey Sarson. Uh, Jeffrey, thank you for being coming on. Thank you, Matthew. A pleasure to be here. Jeffrey, it would be good to uh, you know get a little bit of an introduction to yourself, kind of who you knew are, um, where you got to, um, you know, with you knew, and, and what was the inspiration? So uh, I'm a uh, engineer by training. Uh, I'm a 30 year uh, health tech entrepreneur. Spent my whole career in imaging and informatics. Most recently, I was the CEO of a company called Terra Recon. Uh, we really transformed the radiology advanced visualization business. And after the exit of that company, I went looking for the biggest problem in medical imaging that I could solve. And um, joining me on that journey was my co-founder, Gail Kuhn, and later on another co-founder, Gordon Harris. Um, what we really found was a tremendous disconnect in terms of how imaging data and measurements are managed and how they're kept together over time. And because of all of the disparate workflows, it means that pharma companies ultimately are not in possession of all of this high impact, well-labeled imaging data. And so the ramifications of that become pretty obvious in terms of AI and training models uh, in informing tomorrow's drug design. So we built a platform to solve it. And that's what I'm here to talk to you about today. Oh, perfect. Perfect. And um, you know, why, why does medical imaging matter? Like, um, you know, what, what sort of impact does it have with regards to kind of the work that you do? So there's a couple ways to look at imaging. One is that it's a surrogate marker for uh, clinical trials, where in many cases in cancer care, you don't have five years. The gold standard endpoint is five-year all-cause, you know, mortality or survival. But because you know, patients can be very sick in late phase trials, you don't have five years to wait. So you need something you can measure that shows response that the, that the treatment is having an effect on the tumor. So 90% of all cancers uh, have solid tumor imaging, and you can mm -hmm. look at the response of that tumor over time and use that as a surrogate marker to, to say that there is, um, that, that the treatment is efficacious, that it's having some effect on the patient. And so that measurement of the number of months of progression-free disease becomes very, very important as an endpoint in clinical trials. And there's many different ways of measuring that endpoint. And so you need a platform that's driving the data, the workflow, and the measurements all in one to make that happen. And surprisingly, it didn't exist. Uh, so that's at the, heart of the, at the heart of the problem and why imaging is important. Now, outside of clinical trials, when you get into clinical decision support, when you get into real world data and other use cases of imaging data, then there's the power of the actual pixel or voxel data inside those images. So not just looking at the picture and have people you know, opine about what they see in the images, but you can look for unknown unknowns in imaging, which is really exciting. You can mm -hmm. say, well, I know that the genetics or the blood work or the pathology has a certain value. And therefore, is there anything unique that a computer can see in these images that humans can't see? That's called a radiomic. And that is a very rich area of discovery. Um, there's already enough evidence in published work to say that it absolutely does work. It's at the foundation of all the imaging AI companies you see out there. But what's really neat is that creating those radiomics is quite easy. Getting the data is quite hard. And the pharma companies are the ultimate uh, beneficiaries where they could be using it uh, for drug design and clinical trial design, et cetera. Um, so really it becomes the AI problem and opportunity becomes a data problem and opportunity. Okay. And uh, what, what are the challenges in sort of clinical trial imaging data that you're finding? So <clears throat> one is that they... The measurements that are made during the clinical trial are indicative of exactly what tumor you're measuring. So imagine if you had the results for what the progression of the disease was, and you had mm -hmm. all the other patients' information, but you didn't have those measurements that you made that brought you to that value. So that's mm -hmm. what's missing today is the labels on the images that exactly match the clinical outcomes within the context of a controlled environment like a clinical trial 
Today we have the images with no labels on them, or we have the measurements, but not the source images. But what we need is the measurements, the labels, and the source images. That's the way to train models. And there's no system keeping that together uh, until Unix. Obviously, it seems like quite a, yeah, uh, an obvious problem that there was in the industry and a much needed one. Um, wh why do you think it's something that hasn't been explored until sort of Unu decided to, to dive in? That's at the essence of, of our name. So as, as I was uh, drilling down with my co-founders into the problem and realizing that a small fraction of clinical trials actually have their data sent for central review. Central review is where the imaging data is sent off. They might have one or multiple readers do the reading, look for disparities between those measurements. But because it's expensive and most of those processes are expensive because they're manual, most trials don't have their data sent for central review. They're having to use the site assessments where the patient is. And it, you know, when we started tracing the root cause of why don't pharma companies have this well-labeled imaging data from their trials, you start to realize that the accurate labeling is happening in a separate place, which is the central review the CRO that's doing that work. And meanwhile, the sites are the ones who are taking the measurements that are putting the patients on the trial. So we uncovered this problem by saying, okay, why isn't this well-labeled AI, uh, you know, uh, appropriate data in existence started to understand the workflow between the site and the imaging CRO versus the sponsor. And then when you go into the site, they're unable to take the, the measurements accurately. So, you know, it's almost a coping that occurred that because sites couldn't do the measurements accurately, imaging CROs were used because the workflow is so manual, it's expensive to do it centrally. And so you end up with a situation mm -hmm. where the sponsors have to choose between inaccurate site data or very expensive central data that's disconnected from the patient in the workflow. And so the reason we're called UNU is, is whether you're talking to a site or an imaging CRO, a CRO or a sponsor, all of them told us, hey, we know. And by the way, everybody knows. There is no solution to this problem. And until there is one, we, we can't feel bad about something we can't solve. And so we, yeah. we really studied that problem hard and discovered that the problem was a connectedness so that there could be a unified workflow across all of these stakeholders. And if they're connected and the workflow is unified, you can have a data preserving, highly efficient workflow. Um, we remove 80% mm. of the CRC effort, half of the radiology review time, and preserve 100% of the data while removing a 30% inaccuracy rate, sometimes higher. Um, so, you know, when, the great way to have a huge amount of impact is look for a huge problem. <laughs> and we found one. Makes sense. Makes sense. And perfect. And how, how did you go about creating the sort of image informed sort of communities to be able to do that? So <clears throat> we went through a process of first really understanding the problem. And I think for any innovators or for anyone even looking at prospective companies to take a job, I really feel that in the area of, of cutting edge technology, the candidates should be interviewing their companies as much as the companies are interviewing the candidate. And the things to look for are uh, an obsession and passion around the problem, not around the solution. If you see a lot of time spent saying, well, I have a solution, now let me go you, show you all the problems I can solve, that's definitely backwards. And so we took the approach of first understanding the problem deeply. And the problem was sponsors should be directly connected to their imaging endpoints with accuracy. Mm -hmm. Everything else is a detail, that's the problem. And then within that, you look at, okay, how do things work today and who can I serve along that entire supply chain or value chain between those endpoints so that you have a business model? Because if you aren't adding value to people, everyone along the way, then you're going to have a lot of friction and you're not going to have good product market fit, which is really the second thing to look for is evidence of solid product market fit 
along the entire chain, value chain, mm -hmm. on the farthest ends, you know, on, on each extreme of the problem, in this case, from the patient at the site to the sponsor. So we, we understood all those things and said, okay, what the world is missing is a stateful, meaning there's a workflow, data network, meaning it connects people and manages data that never mm -hmm. lets the data go once it has it, unless people want to delete it, but we, we preserve it so we never have to go find it. We're not dependent on integrations and it gets them all the way to accuracy, which means we needed measurement tools. Once we had that definition, it didn't have a name, but it was a stateful imaging data network. We went looking for the best way to buy it, which is basically mm -hmm. you run a buy partner build and you say, is there anything I can buy? Is there anyone I can partner with? Or what would I build? And of course, there was nothing to you know, buy or partner with. So we said, we have to build. One of my phone calls was to one of my former customers at Mass General Hospital. I had no idea he was involved in clinical trials. He became one, our third co-founder, Dr. Gordon Harris. And he said, Jeff, you're describing a system that manages all sites in an imaging clinical trial. I've built a system mm -hmm. that's managing all the clinical trials at my site, and I have licensed it to other sites. So we did four months of analysis. What we realized was the trials being run across that system, if they just went to all sites in the trials they touched, because they were only at a certain number of sites, if we just closed the loop on all sites in a trial, it would be 8,008 sites. And so we oh, said, wow. what a phenomenal way to achieve you know, deep domain expertise um, and scale and credibility. And so we licensed that technology. We brought a bunch of the experts over to our co company. Um, and I brought a bunch of industry experts that I'd worked with before. And that's how you knew a company that many people have never heard of is managing 4,200 imaging clinical trials today. Oh, wow. Fantastic. And uh, yeah, sounds like quite a good job you guys did there with regards to yeah, being able to build them communities and you know, source and sort of the requirements that were needed. And um, diving into some of the technical side of things, how did you guys sort of come up with you know, the right technologies and, and how to develop the platform for scalability? So, yeah, I give all of the credit there to our R&D team. Um, so I'm uh, more on the product vision specification, sales business development side, but I've been a contributor in that process. Um, and really, you know, you have to start with what technology stack has the features that are most important to you. And in our case, we started with our data model. Again, first principles are so important when you're making big mm -hmm. decisions. And the first principle was that we want every data element on our platform. So whether it's operational about how many orders or if it's uh, how many people logged in and from where or how long did they stay, um, that type of data about orders and patients and trials and protocols and setup is, is all needs to be discrete data elements because they help the clinical operations team tremendously. They're not so involved in, is this clinically right? They're involved in getting all the data collected, traceable, accurate. The other stakeholders are interested in the clinical accuracy where you have the principal or treating investigator you have the imaging team with the radiologists and technologists and researchers. You have the study staff that are making sure everything adds up and creating the artifacts that are going in the EREG folder. So we really you know, chose our tech stack based on a services infrastructure that could scale infinitely. And then we had to do all of the security required to be a global data system that meets all of the global standards without having to put a cloud up in, in every country. So we looked at the systems that help us manage our cloud. We looked at the services infrastructure that could help us uh, you know, with a data first model. And honestly, you almost can't go wrong on cloud infrastructures, right? They're, they're all fairly similar. Uh, but mm -hmm. the applications that run on them and the technologies that you use to connect your platform to those cloud data systems and make them real time and seamless, there's a lot of very important choices to make um, in that arena. And how did you go about making them choices? Choices and yeah, you know, what um, sort of technologies and uh, what is the stack that you're using at the moment? So you know, when it came to what choices, we built uh, our roadmap. 
and uh, looked at the best, you know, you, you can only see a few years out or you're kidding yourself, right? In terms mm-hmm. of like real clarity. So we tried to go about four years out and say where we think we'd like to be and then look at where we are and the difficulty of migrating. So I think the matrix really was time to market, um, ability to get us to our four-year long-range goal, and then the migration effort if we had to move off of other systems. In terms of what systems we use, I think I would I would rather defer to my CTO to do that at a different time uh, <laughs> because uh, I'd, I'd, have, I'd more likely be uh, wrong than right. I can say that one of the really uh, impactful decisions we made is we actually used software tooling uh, to help us with our security compliance. So we can have real-time monitoring. We mm-hmm. can provide uh, our customers and vendor partners dashboards of our compliance. And when we need to meet a new security uh, set of security requirements, we actually can see the services we support and the services we don't. So anytime we want to like add a new security control for, let's say, a new country or a new use case, we only have to go tighten up a few things and we can repurpose everything else. So looking at that scaling is important. And I will say, you know, I get the question a lot. How does a company with 20 employees manage 4,200 active clinical trials? And the answer is technology that's simple for customers to use so they can onboard their trials and technology to help you manage your customers so that everything isn't manual. Anytime you think about hiring people, do it for their skill sets more than do it for the scaling. If it's for the scaling, you can probably use technology. If it's for the skill set, technology will Mm -hmm. never do it. Okay, perfect. No, it makes sense. And and how how does Unu go about uh, you know the explainability and transparency of that to researchers and sponsors? So <clears throat> there's there's a couple ways to think about explainability. One is uh, kind of the simplest form is through uh, a stateful data network. We can actually prove who measured what when. And then we can uh, show the calculations for the overall response and even the Mm -hmm. communications that happen because sometimes humans disagree. Even humans disagree with machines or machines disagree with machines. And so the very simplest form of important explainability is to have the traceability of how you got to that value, right? It's provenance. Mm -hmm. Now, if you talk about the more sophisticated Uh, side of explainability, which is that I've used this data to train a model, and now I want to understand why that model said what it did. In imaging, Mm. that's actually quite, uh, has a simple sort of savior in the mix, that when you train an imaging model, it's looking for things like textures or anatomic landmarks, et cetera. And each of those are generally layers in this model. And when it's done, the model can tell you where it sees the difference, not why it sees the difference. So the explainability Mm. that's very useful, there was just a paper that came out this year and it was about uh, using imaging, a radiomic. They trained it based on pre-diabetic patients on imaging before they were diagnosed. And sure enough, the power of medical imaging was seen because in the images of those patients who had not yet been diagnosed as being pre-diabetic, in the images of pre-diabetic patients, a green haze would appear over the images in certain places. And in non-pre-diabetic patients that the model had never seen, they would not. And the green haze appeared over the pectoral muscles. And so then we learned by that that there's a difference in the fat pads on the pectoral muscles of pre-diabetic patients. And that gives you a very good indication of how you might do clinical trial matching, or screening Mm -hmm. patients to participate, or even getting patients on medications and therapies before they turn pre-diabetic. And that's really some of the most exciting areas of imaging is there is a signal in those images that can change patient enrollment in clinical trials. It can automate measurements that are laborious. And it can, probably the absolute most important thing, even above detection, is it can help you select patients before it's actually clinically seen, it's anatomically seen, and that's becoming provable uh, and explainable. So 
that's the reason that sponsors are so interested in preserving their imaging data. Perfect. And, and how, how does that work with regards to integration with clinical trials, so like uh, CTMS or uh, yeah, electronic health records? Yeah, so we're doing uh, a number of integrations. And a lot of times integrations are difficult for companies because they have to figure out how to get particular data elements out of their system. They're not organized. The data isn't organized to be readily accessible. But again, mm. going back to the foundational design of our system, all of the data, including the status of the patient, the orders or the measurements, the readers, all of that are all already in a stateful organized database. So integrating our system to another data system just means importing some of their results into our database or exporting from our database into theirs. Those are simple API integrations. Um, so for us, we're seeing value, for example, in integrating to the CTMS. So we know what patients are on a trial. Um, there's uh, clinical database uh, offerings uh, from, from EDC companies, for example, or clinical data management companies that aggregate all the trial data in the cloud for pharma companies that we can put the real-time data directly into their, uh, into their cloud so while the integrations are interesting and important, um, the real problem we solve is that each imaging assessment is taking 30 to 45 minutes. We can accelerate that dramatically. They're, they have a 30 to 50% error rate for zero. And you know the integration that we need to make all of that value happen is a simple mm -hmm. DICOM integration to the PACS, or would they use our web uploader? Just put imaging data in, the study staff works in our tool, we don't need any integration mm -hmm. at all. However, uh, we are maniacally focused on eliminating dual entry and inefficiencies for everyone involved. And part of that includes uh, integrations, but they're quite simple, they're meaningful, they're easy, and we have a number of them available. Okay, perfect. And as I was gonna say, like, how do you guys address like the, uh, the challenge of different imaging formats um, and machines like across those instructions? So DICOM, you know, imaging, one of, one of the, uh, you know, very helpful things about imaging is there is a real standard that people have stuck to, which is rare. <clears throat> In healthcare, mm -hmm. there's many standards, but they're not often consistently used. But the DICOM standard in imaging, which is how you can query and receive or send imaging data to another entity, is ubiquitously used and is, in fact, a standard. So... Um, in terms of us to be able to communicate DICOM images and have people work in our system, that's in fact a standard, which is super, uh, which is super helpful. There are other associated imaging data formats where with that might be reports or data in an Excel sheet or uh, just clinical notes, for example, that need to have you know OCR run on them. So what we've done is we've created an uploader that can automatically ingest that non-DICOM content and perform de-identification on all of it. But mm -hmm. as soon as you start getting into integrations with all the other structured content, that's where things become complex. And we usually recommend to first put our system in, get the first value, and then we start working on those other, those other integration points. Perfect. Perfect. Now, thank you for that. Um, so moving on to maybe like uh, yeah the impact that UNU's having uh, you know on patients itself. Like how how does UNU's work you know directly benefit the patients? Uh, if you can maybe share some sort of real insight uh, into that and how it's improved the you know, overall outcomes. Yeah. So some of the the sad, completely measurable and demonstrable truths about the current situation is that. Patients are not being enrolled in trials that they would be eligible for because there are mm -hmm. requirements about how soon uh, after they either start medications or that they can't start certain medications to be on the trial and that mm -hmm. you have to have your imaging baseline done to know that they're eligible for the trial. So um, in terms of benefiting patients, we can greatly help the enrollment, not only the accuracy, but the volume of patient enrollments by making it much more friction-free and much more accurate and systematized about how patients 
eligibility scans are done and their timeliness, where otherwise, if there's no workflow, you can imagine balls get dropped because it's Excel spreadsheets and someone's on PTO mm. and this happens. Yeah. So, you know, what we've found is that of the overall 30% uh, patient dropout rate, 10% of the 30% or a third is due to imaging endpoints. Now, um, you can imagine that that can also be because if you have a 30 to 50% error rate, you might be taking patients off the trial for progression that weren't actually progressing. And then you also have the patients that fell off the trial because of the workflow issues. So what we've seen in terms of patient benefit, you know, most patients who have a serious illness are very interested in clinical trials and, and want to participate. When we put our system in an NCI designated comprehensive cancer center, we see the number of trials they offer go up by 20 to 40%. So not just the number of patients on the trial, but the number of trials. How can that be? It's because mm -hmm. there is a very serious shortage of people that can work in cancer centers. For every one CRC job, clinical research coordinator, there's seven openings. So the answer is not to hire more. The answer is to start using technology to drive efficiency. And what we've mm -hmm. seen, which is very encouraging, is even just something like getting imaging assessments done smarter and better and faster can have a dramatic effect on the number of trials and the number of patients on trials. I think we should really be focused in the pragmatic areas, the pedestrian areas of workflow and data management. And we're a little bit too enamored with complete AI automation of which you can never get there without, without evidence. And you can mm -hmm. never collect the evidence with the former that I just mentioned. So yeah. That's our personal belief about where we can be most impactful uh, for patients. If you can maybe give some examples then as well, like of how UNU's impact within clinical trials is helping accelerate uh, bringing new patient, new treatments to patients. Yeah. So <clears throat> if you think about um, kind of a, a, a sophisticated emerging use case, which is called uh, Theranostics, in Theranostics, um, what happens is uh, maybe some are familiar with a PET CT scan, a PET CT, and that means it's measuring the metabolism or that the cancer is metabolizing sugars faster and therefore metabolizing um, the injectable agent faster. And you see it on the pictures. What Theranostics is, is that they genetically uh, modify the, the medication being injected so that it attaches to the cancer, the actual cancer. So now, even though you're still measuring things the same way with the same PET scanner, the thing that's, that's sort of the hot spot that you see is now not the metabolism of the cancer, it's actually the agent attached to the cancer. And within that, they deliver a payload, which is a beta particle or some, some radiation that goes along with that attached particle. And so between those two mm -hmm. things, that means that imaging is not only part of the diagnostic, it's part of the therapy, which is why they call it Theranostics. And in that arena, all of the kind of measurements that we take, you need to be looking holistically across the patient and doing things like calculating their total tumor volume. Well, that's a great use for AI to do that automatically. Then you want to go mark certain mm. lesions and track their response over time. That's exactly what our system does. And because we can set the trial up once and give it to many people who can do this work um, in a consistent way, that means that we can not only accelerate the development of these kinds of therapies, but we can accelerate their ability to be, you know, to run a wide scale trial and get them to market quickly which is a, a very hot area of the market. Um, mm. We also are able to modify the measurements in our system in ways that others aren't. So we can customize our measurements to help small pharma companies that may not have the attention of these centralized uh, reading organizations and allow them a way that at small scale, 
you can still have world-class measurements and get your drug proven and get it to market. Um, and again, with the error rates that we talked about, imagine if, if your whole company is one very high potential molecule and imaging is really important, but your sites have a 50% error, what that mm -hmm. would do to, to getting your, your, your drug to market. One last thing, Matthew, about that is half of all drugs today that are in development are either early phase trials where they have new treatments that are being tested, which means small patient populations, or they're rare mm -hmm. diseases, which means there aren't even a lot of patients to go collect on the trial. And so if half of all trials, let's say, have 50 or less patients, then if you have even three or four of them drop out because of these imaging issues and accuracy issues, as a percentage of the total effectiveness of your drug, it could very well mean that an effective drug doesn't even make it to market. Oh, wow. Where do you see the future and what sort of challenges do we need to um, you know, attempt to, to overcome to be able to prevent that? So, you know, in many respects, our, our platform is expressly designed to overcome that challenge. You need a system that can be set up once, distributed to many other people, is an end-to-end, -end, easy to use workflow. And so we do the data upload, the de-identification, the trial workflow, the uh, orchestration of the actual reads, the delivery of the results are all features of our platform. So. Um, even in the in the future where precision medicine is much more image enabled and, and people need to be able to collaborate and see these results and work side by side with AI, then you have to have all of those components I just mentioned. And that's really the passion behind our product and our project, mm -hmm. if you will, our mission is that imaging will not have a role in precision medicine if we don't preserve the imaging data and if we can't drive the workflow and invite these imaging insights, the problem exists in clinical decision support, the problem exists in tumor boards, it's not just clinical trials. Um, it even exists in, in the real world data that's accessible today is de largely devoid of, of well-labeled imaging data. So I really do believe that our solution and our approach, it's absolutely designed to be a holistic answer uh, to that problem. So with, with respect to whether or not um, there's an answer to the problem, right? How do we bring things like Theranostics where the diagnostic uh, imaging and quantitative measurements are important to the treatment and they become combined? UNU is really a holistic answer to that. It's, it's why we exist. It's, it's why we designed the platform you can set up the trial one time with the exact measurements that you need. You can then invite sites, give them a way to manage the data, uh, either with a web uploader or a little piece of software that communicates with their imaging system. And then when the patient is scanned, the data is moved to a qualified reader, which can be anywhere. It mm -hmm. is then processed where we're actually watching for compliance to the measurement requirements. We're applying any AI processing. For example, you could calculate the total tumor volume or something that would be laborious without uh, AI. And then delivering the results, but it's entirely repeatable. So what's interesting is you can take the quality of a central review that used to be manual and take weeks and deploy it at many sites at once and do it in real time. And the answer is combine the workflow, the data management, and the measurement tools and allow them to be programmed for these use cases. The last really interesting thing is that this problem isn't, doesn't exist just in clinical trials. If it did, you might say, well, I'm sure there's a lot of well-labeled imaging data just from the provider side and all of the tests that they do. Mm. But PAC systems have, that's what radiologists use, they have no workflow built in. Um, they're not persisting the measurements on the images that actually are matched to what's in the report. Believe it or not, when radiologists are sitting and working every day, reading 100 studies a day, the PAC system that they're looking at the pictures in and the reporting system they're putting the numbers and the verbal interpretation in, 
have no integration whatsoever in America today. So in reality, we have this same problem we have in clinical trials. That's a great place to start. But we mm. have the same problem in clinical decision support, in typical radiological interpretation, and even in the tumor boards where patients are being treated or surgeries are being planned. Um, so this is you know, a very big problem. Um, and our system is just starting in clinical trials. We have a lot of runway in terms of clinical decision support and real world data, et cetera. One day, every patient should receive this kind of accurate workflow driven care, uh, mm -hmm. not what we do today. And how far do you think we are away from, from having that? You know, <clears throat> I have a 30 year career in imaging and informatics. And what I've seen is that changing the standard of care completely end to end, change it so that it just works differently takes 20 years. Unfortunately, that's the fact. You have to go mm -hmm. through the sort of innovator phase and prove it works. You have to have a number of publications because medicine is uh, evidence-based. Um, and then you have to train the next generation of physicians who are, will adopt this new way of working because that's difficult to incorporate into your life. The good news is that the market on the clinical trial side is enormous. And actually, I think that UNU can play a significant role in hacking the system, if you will, mm -hmm. that I don't believe the best way to deploy imaging AI you know, in the wild at scale is in fact to go train, you know, every health system, how to do it, deploy technology in every health system. It's that when the pharma companies and medical device companies are building their next innovations, they should be using the imaging data to train knowledge workers, right? So when they deployed, when they developed and released the latest Alzheimer's drugs, yeah. There's no way to measure that except the atrophy of the brain, which you can see on imaging. But they mm. didn't give the physicians, the family physicians all over the country, they didn't give them a way to measure atrophy of the brain. They could have, but they didn't. So there should, should have been something that just calculates the volume, gives them a number that they can use and understand for prescribing like a lab test. I really believe that imaging should turn into discrete, understandable values that anyone can use. And we have to stop making it separate and making it so difficult. When mm. we do that, that means that in the next generation of drugs that are released, hopefully they actually come with already understood, already able to be run, understandable algorithms that come with them. That, that is the big vision of how things should work. And that mm -hmm. might mean that within five years, you could see you could see that happen within five years. So um, if it goes the traditional way, 20, if it goes the way we'd like to see it go, five. Perfect, understood. Ho hopefully it goes yeah, that way because 20 years, of course, is a long time. We'd like to be able to, to see that happen a lot sooner. And I'm sure Uni is obviously gonna play a huge part in, in making that happen. Um, obviously you mentioned earlier, you guys have kind of like a four year plan on what you're looking to achieve. Kind of how, how yeah. far are you along with that? We're actually, uh, way ahead of schedule. So we actually were uh, scheduled to start the development of our sponsor, you know, pharma med device focused offerings. Um, that included the de-identification uh, web uploader that works on a trial by trial basis, uh, customizable operational mm -hmm. and clinical dashboards, the ability to put AI in the workflow. And all of those are going to be released in the next two months. So we were planning on starting them in June and instead we will finish them in June. In terms of the site side of our business where people are deploying our solution to manage all of the trials at a site, mm -hmm. uh, NCI uh, designated comprehensive cancer centers in particular, we believe that we'll have more than half of all NCI comprehensive cancer centers running all of their oncology imaging trials on our platform by the mm -hmm. end of next year. Okay, and that's a pretty, pretty big goal. We're tracking, we're, uh, we're tracking to that goal <laughs> is the good news. And what sort of things are you putting in place and implementing to be able to achieve that goal by the time frame that you want to? Well, we've been uh, really you know, 
optimizing our uh, customer onboarding, right? So we're very maniacal about uh, customer care, software quality. Mm -hmm. This is a single uh, cloud solution. So a lot of the improvements that, that we talked about earlier in terms of our technology stack and services infrastructure and how we release software and focus on you know, the customer use cases, that all allows us to deploy the N plus one customer without a lot of friction and, and work. So we've, we've uh, really spent time internally making sure that we have good processes and people and training and expertise to onboard an increasing number of uh, cancer centers. Um, and then on the sponsor side, we've spent a lot of time um, with defining what that product is, what they need, and, and gathering their feedback. So it's just a matter of when you have it, we'll buy it. And we're very close uh, you know, to delivering V1 that we can get some really good feedback on. So that's kind of where we're, where we're at. We don't believe we need to be a giant company to vend the whole market because it can become a user managed service and people inside these organizations are as sophisticated as we are and more. Mm -hmm. um, so we need to build great tools and we need to let the customers you know, be able to use it without a lot of effort. And I, I think that's the reason we're able to achieve the goal is we're focused on more software, not more people. That's actually a quite a unique approach. In this mm -hmm. industry, usually people have cloud solutions with hundreds of people in the background making things happen. Um, yeah. It doesn't scale well. It, the first customer is impressed. The 50th customer is not impressed uh, because you can't scale that. So, so that's kind of our, uh, our angle there. Perfect. I mean, you're you in kind of a little bit of a good good place as well where you guys are you know, one of the innovators within this field, um, kind of essentially being the only company doing what you're doing. Is there anyone else out there in the marketplace that would be kind of like a, a direct competitor to you or, or, or are you worried about someone in maybe a year or two's time sort of coming into the market um, and, and looking to capitalize on this gap? Well, I think we're in a blue ocean. So first of all, I'm not worried about uh, competitors, the market is is gigantic, and to the extent <clears throat> that uh, we capitalize on it as successfully as I think we will, um, you know, that's just a matter of time before other people will come up with you know different versions of the solution. We have a first mover advantage for sure. Um, we have the scale based on how we've mm -hmm. come together, which is not easy to do. There also aren't companies that have leadership teams that have both deployed into large health systems at scale with a single technology solution and also understand the workflows of large you know, imaging core labs and CROs. So there's a lot mm -hmm. of domain expertise that's involved. Um, there's been at least $100 million in the last 10 years applied to solving this problem. And as you point out, there's no solution. Um, mm -hmm. So the fact that we've gotten this far this fast shows that we understand the problem well. We are excited to have this market develop because the more people that understand it, uh, the faster we can go to. And so we really want to be the market share leader in a very vibrant, highly competitive market. Then we would prefer to try to be a very small company, you know, as the only one that does something small. I think competition is healthy and I think we're ready. Mm -hmm. We're ready for it. So um, it's not good having nothing to compare to, right? I would love to be able to do head to head demos against somebody, but the only thing we compete against today, just to answer the question, our real competition is things like Dropbox and Excel and email. That's literally how it's done today and manual yep. calculators. And then there are systems that do any given small part or component of it, but they're all different companies and they're all sort of leaders in their field, but doing one fifth of the problem. Uh, you might see those companies try to do the rest of it, but again, the range of domain expertise is quite wide. And I don't think anybody's really focused on it right now. Yeah. And I guess with those sort of companies as well, then security comes a little bit of a, of a question as well with the companies like Dropbox and Excel and so forth. 
Yeah, but but there's also ones that are, you know, e-clinical solutions that are known in the medical device space, but all they do is electronic data capture for imaging, or mm -hmm. they only do adjudication, or they only do image sharing, or they only do measurements, but they're not even a web tool, and you got to buy a box everywhere you want to sit and do it. They're not really built for innovation anymore. Now, that's another thing is that, you know, they're, they're not positioned as growth companies. They're usually highly matrixed and, you know, owned by private equity and 20 years old. So they're not likely to do something completely new. Um, I think in the end, our job is to cut through this noise to understand who the real buyer is in this entire ecosystem, which is the sponsor who's being horribly <laughs> underserved, plug them into these real-time dashboards that'll give them control like they've never seen before, and let them start to understand and measure the inaccuracies in their early phase in rare disease trials, which are their highest potential candidates. You can measure that difference. You can understand the problem. And then the answer becomes clear. I have to have more accurate measurements coming directly from the sites. There isn't any company in the world making sure you can get accurate measurements from sites, aside from all the other things we said. So I think we do have both uh, multiple beachheads, but lastly, in terms of all of those companies being our competitors, we also believe in an open system. So we want to tech enable the Sponsors, CROs, imaging CROs, and sites, um, and everyone is welcome to use our tools and to build businesses upon our tools. We're not trying to be exclusionary. And since we don't overlap with anyone else's core competencies, we do see a lot of interest in being adopted by most of those. The only real enemy we have along the way that, that wouldn't be excited about our technology is the people who benefit from selling labor into an inefficient market. Those people are either going to have to adopt technology and be more efficient or we're a, we're a competitor. But I think in terms of you know, the, the viewership of Barrington James, I think that's another thing that both employers and candidates should really you know, look at is finding a way to be additive to a very broad swath of the market rather than trying to find ways to disintermediate people, find ways to connect and bring people together and be additive and you can move fast. What would be like the one bit of critical advice you would give to, to, to candidates that we work with that maybe are looking to explore a career in, in the area that you focus in? Yeah, I think for, for candidates, I would encourage them to do their research on companies. It's easy to look at a company and say, well, if they have a website, if they've been in business for whatever, five years, even if that's where everybody's going, you don't always want to go where everybody's going. And you, you can't uh, assume in diligence a company by appearances. Talk to their mm. customers, talk to their former employees, talk to their current employees, um, to the extent they're willing to share and some aren't, but understand at least their general you know, finances and play. I do see a lot of people chasing the shiny object and in technology, it's a lot like hockey saying, but you don't want to go where the puck is. You want to skate to where the puck is going. And to do that requires yeah. some research. If you see everyone going somewhere, that's where the puck is. It's not where the puck is going. And I, I see a lot of you know friends and colleagues making these mistakes of jumping on the hot thing instead of jumping on the impactful thing, do your homework. And is there any sort of resources out there that you would recommend people looking at to be able to sort of anticipate where the puck would be next? So, you know, I think you can look for people that, that have a change mindset, a transformation mindset versus a growth mindset. It's easy to have a growth mindset. It's easy to project a growth mindset, but True growth and transformation is really driven by product and driven by change and driven by a unique point of view that people care about. And so, you know, that's really what I would suggest is that anytime you have a giant hockey stick growth, you know, curve, 
Mm. That's because somebody made great decisions two to four years ago. That did not happen now. It's not macroeconomics. It's because someone made some bets earlier that that mattered. Um, and so, you know, I think really you you can you can sort of vet out companies that way that if they push too hard on a growth mindset, look for the underlying technology that drives the growth mm -hmm. and look for evidence that it's true. If it is, you probably have a great growth company to join. Likewise, you might have a great startup that hasn't hit its growth trajectory yet. Um, but again, I think in general, I don't see candidates doing their research and interviewing. Use LinkedIn. It's a very valuable resource to be able to find ex-employees, alumni, et cetera. Mm -hmm. It's a big deal making a, making a job move. And it surprises me that people don't don't do the analysis to really understand where they're going before they go. They find out after they've went. Oh, hundred percent, hundred percent. Obviously, we see that we see that quite a lot in our field. Last year, definitely one of the areas that we really emphasise and try and supply as much information as possible um, to them when they are looking and, and going for jobs. Um, in, in terms of you, know, when you guys are taking on talent and and looking at people, you know, what are the key things that you look for? in a person to have? So I think, uh, you know, <clears throat> culture fit is really important, uh, probably more so in a small company than, than a big company where you can kind of plug in and find your way. But we look for people with an insatiable curiosity about the problem. You need to wake up every day and, you know, be willing to go outside the box, be willing to do a little research, be willing to, you know, quote unquote, waste time, but filling your brain, looking for mm -hmm. better ways to do things. Um, we generally also, or at least I, and I've, I've been on multiple different sort of growth transformation journeys. And, you know, we also look for people that are very flexible and adaptable and broadly skilled and trainable. So you mm -hmm. can take people who are deeply scientific and you might be able to, you know, it's easy to say, but they're not salespeople. But if you take a deeply scientific person and you teach them commercial process and sales skills and sort of the cadence of a customer call, now you have somebody who can answer every question with credibility and who can manage a process. You can teach the process, but not the, you know, the deep knowledge so, you know, for those out there who are unicorns, startups are amazing places to go where you can have a broad span of control. You can have very significant impact and a very steep uh, sort of climb to the top in those companies because you build people under them. Mm. And, um, you know, just the people who know how to manage and live in a big company and manage a lot of people, they don't really fit because they don't know what it is. They only know how to manage people who manage it. Uh, and that's really what we look for is, is people who are coachable, good culture fit, broadly skilled, very curious, um, because they can do anything and they can grow with your company. Perfect. Perfect. Well, look, it's been an absolute pleasure, um, obviously, getting to know a little bit more about you, Nu, yourself, Jeffrey. Um, for our listeners, you know, that want to maybe find out a little bit more about yourself and what the company does, uh, wh where can they find you? So uh, great resources, our website, yunu.io, uh, Y-U-N-U. -U. We also have a LinkedIn page that's full of thought leadership content uh, that people uh, can go to as well. Those are really the best two resources. Perfect. Perfect. Well, uh, Jeffrey, thank you so much for your time. It's been a, an absolute pleasure speaking with you. Um, yeah, I look forward to catching up with you very, very soon. And yeah, thank you for your time. Appreciate it, Matthew. Thanks for the opportunity and uh, really appreciate the work uh, you and Barrington James do. Thank you. Not a problem at all. Cheers for your time. Thank you. Bye.